so we're going to do a workshop together in two parts. And uh, before diving into part one, which will involve a bunch of questions put up here on the board, part two are the pieces of paper that you have in your chair. I just want to share very quickly why I'm doing this. Two years ago, I arrived in the UK to do this job for President Obama. And six years ago, I did my first diplomatic posting in Sweden. Has anyone ever been to Sweden? Stockholm? Okay. Great Somali population in Sweden. Um, so I used to be in the internet business. I hadn't been in diplomacy yet. And I met with President Obama in the Oval Office. He had just, you know, newly president. I was about to go to Sweden. And I went in and I said, Mr. President, what advice would you have for me as a first-time diplomat? And I don't think he was really expecting the question, but he sat back and he thought for a moment. He said, well, Matthew, uh, listen. I said, great. So I pulled out my pen and my little black book, which I had at the time, to write down all his pearls of wisdom. But that's all he said. And it took me a second, just like it's taking you a second, that he wasn't saying, listen to what I'm about to say. His advice was, listen. Listen, and hopefully learn from what you listen to. And uh, that's what I'm really doing here today. So I have done a workshop like we're about to do together almost 100 times around the UK in these last two years. Up in Aberdeen, down in Brighton, Belfast, Canterbury, Cardiff, Durham, lots here around London. So that's what we're doing. So we'll dive right into it. We're going to do just a show of hands here. I'm going to raise my hand with everyone because a teacher up in Scotland told me that that's a good thing to do. So I'll do that. Have you ever been to the United States? Rest, uh, raise your hand. One, yes. How many people have been? Okay, some of us. Two, no. Most of us. Yes, but only to Florida. I'll raise my hand. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, yeah, yeah. Would you like to go to the United States? Or go again if you've been? One for yes, two for no. How many for yes? How many for no? No right or wrong answer, we're being honest. This is good. So I have listed five foreign policy issues that the United States or the United Kingdom or both of us that you have certainly followed in the news over the last year or two. And I'd like to ask you to think for a moment, if you had to pick one of these that is most important to you, which would it be? Now. You may have an issue that's not on that list, and we'll have a chance in part two to talk about that. But if you had to pick from this list, Middle East peace, you know, Israel, Palestine, and related issues, number one. Number two, UK, its relationship with the European Union. Number three, ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, different names for one hateful organization. Four, Ukraine, what Russia's aggression in Ukraine, Crimea. That's all number four. And then number five, climate change. Got it? Okay, how many people of those five would think Middle East peace is the most important to you? Okay. How many people, UK in the relationship with the European Union? ISIS, ISIL, IS, Ukraine, Russia, just me. Climate change. Okay, thank you. Now, this is a two-part question. This first part, I'm trying to get at what you think about what the US government, so my government, thinks about. The next question we'll get to is about the American people, not the, not the people they elect to govern them. Mm -hmm. So this is about the government. From what you see, read, and hear, some of you have been to America, lots of you have read about America, your, your perceptions of my government. Do you think it is, number one, concerned most about the security, number two, concerned most about the freedoms, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, that, that sort of thing? Or do you think my government is primarily concerned with something that isn't security and isn't protecting freedoms of its citizens? Got it? Yeah. Okay. How many think that the number one most important thing to the U.S. government is security, keeping its people safe? Okay. How many people think mainly what my government cares about is protecting the freedoms of its citizens? Another group? How many people think it is not one or two, but some third thing? Okay, great. Anyone who 
raise their hand for number three to share with the group what you were thinking. Not security, not freedom. What is it? I think um, the U.S. is, you know, so much involved in other parts of the world. Yeah. So it's like actually going to try and enforce their way of security, what they see as security or yes. beliefs in other parts So of is the power world. one way of saying it? Yeah, control. 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 Okay, so control is one word. Uh, beyond the borders. Like police in other parts of the world. Yeah, okay. Um, power. But extending beyond its own people at home. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else who raised their hand for number three want to get something else up here? Yes, sir. Um, well, the first thing I would like to address is uh, the media of America. Yeah, okay. How let, do you personally feel about let me circle back to media. I'm going to get through with this, and we'll, it's a perfect thing to talk about in part two. So we'll have it up here. We'll get back to, to media. Very important thing for us to talk about. Okay. This is the part two I was telling you about. This is not, not the government, but citizens, the people who vote for that government, the American people. What do you think is most important to them? How many people do you think the most important thing to American citizens are their security. Okay, some of us. How many people think it is their freedoms? Bigger group, okay. Welcome. How many people think American people care about something that isn't security and isn't freedom? Okay. I asked you earlier about individual <coughs> issues, Middle East peace, ISIL, climate change, those sorts of things. How about we take a step back from those specific issues? Welcome. So now let's take a step back and just in general, do you think the United States, my country, is number one, two involved around the world dealing yeah. with problems? Yes. Okay, well, we'll vote in a second. Number two, not doing enough? Or number three, do you think we're getting that balance just about right? Okay. So how many people here feel that the United States is too involved in the world's problems? One, two, three, okay. Pretty big group of us. How many people think we're not doing enough? Some of us, okay. How many think we're getting the balance just about right? Few of us, okay. Same exact question, except your country, United Kingdom. Got it? Okay, how many think the UK is too involved around the world? Some of us, okay. Not doing enough? Bigger group of us. Getting the balance just right? Few of us, okay. Great job, we're done with the hand raising part. Now we're gonna go into part two. And sir, can I borrow your card? The, the, the Okay, everyone should have, and if you don't have one, please raise your hand and we will get you one. A card like this, it has two sides to it. I'd like you to please turn it over to the side that says frustrate, concern, and confuse at the top. Thank you. And I'd like to ask you to please draw me a picture of something that frustrates you or confuses you or concerns you about the United States and what we're up to. A picture. Now, I happen not to be a very good artist. It doesn't have to be a nice picture. It could be a little cartoon, little, you know, a little doodle, as we say in America. Some people prefer to write a word or a few words instead of a picture or in addition to a picture. That's fine, too. Whatever works for you. But something that comes to mind, a frustration, a concern, a confusion, some mixture of those emotions as it relates to the United States, please. Okay. You could probably guess what's coming next. Who would like to start us off and share with the group what they wrote down, what their frustration concern? Yes, sir. And yes. Yes. Um, I drew a picture of a drone. Okay. And um, I do get Can frustrated I see? with um, drones. Because I'm basically, I see it as a killing machine. Okay. I see it as a machine which does not choose between humans, it's just, you know, Whatever that's in its path or any place or any position in the world, it could take out anybody. 
and I, I believe that shouldn't be the way to solve the mm. uh, world's problems or you know to bring peace in the world. Got it. So, so drones was the issue there, the picture of a drone. Yes, ma'am. I actually brought the same point. Same. And to illustrate my frustration, I've used a red pen to illustrate the blood of mm. innocent people. For me, drone is, is very, very frustrating, not for myself. When a person sits in Virginia, use an item <coughs> look like a a game, and um, my memory of drone is an entire family in Afghanistan who were celebrating the wedding were wiped off. So mm -hmm. it's not only a drone. When it when they it kills, it kills civilians. Got it. So why don't we use red there just to also capture the fact that you wrote that in red ink and it means blood to you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I think I mean, what. What frustrates me about the U.S. is its policy towards Middle East, particularly and proudly towards Muslim countries. Well. Second is my concern about U.S. is this equality between U.S. citizens of the government to the citizens when it comes to minority groups like blacks, Muslims, and yeah. and Latinos. Two really important but different issues that we've captured up here. One is U.S. policy towards Middle East. Muslim countries more broadly, but yes. both in there. And then the second issue is one about back home in the United States, what rela relationships are between different faith communities, between you know, racial minorities, things like that. Okay. Uh, what confuses me is how the U.S. wants to remain part of the world. I, don't, I confuse their policy, how they want to okay. for the last 50 years, all, I mean, the coming 50 years, all the, and maybe yeah, so let's capture, it gets at some of these issues we talked about here, but let's, uh, U.S. role in the world, next 50. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah, so this is picking up, expanding on the earlier comment. It's not just racial tensions within the United States that you might be seeing about, reading about, but how that reflects onto the rest of the world and the perception of, quote, the West or the Western world reflecting from America out. Uh, yes, sir. Ooh. This is one of the really good artists. This is a beautiful, if scary, picture of a human skull. So what did, when you do that, what were you? Okay, great. Tell me more about what, tell me more why you drew that very powerful picture. Safety of... Oh, good. To do it now is a good time to explain. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, for instance, around the media. Okay. We'll get to that. All right. Welcome. For those of you coming late, uh, just scribble a word about something that frustrates you or concerns you about the United States. Please. Yes. Okay. So we have three things here in this picture. We've got air bombardment, helicopter, and tanks. You just, I think I get it, but I want to make sure. Um, is it use of U.S. military power? Okay. So let's say use of military directly by the U.S. and through other countries in other countries. Okay. How about, yes, sir. Uh, my concern is the uh, interference of the United States in the Somalia affairs in Somalia, particularly the support for neighboring countries which have a very uh, bad history with Somalia against Somali people, their culture, 
the religion, and everything Somali. Okay, so U.S. foreign policy as it relates to Somalia and the neighborhood is of frustration and concern to you. Uh, their support of the neighbor's interest against Somali interest in their own country. Okay, in you have that. Okay, that's captured up there. Okay. Any other ones in the back? Let's get a few. Yes, sir. The U.S. Um, gun, um, gun policy. Yeah. So, did anyone draw a picture or write the word gun, gun control, gun? If you did, can you hold it up in the air? Yes, you have gun. There's the gun. Yeah. Yeah, you've got guns. You've got one too. Yeah. Did you yeah, also have guns? No. I oh. drew a picture of a tree, which uh, I didn't mention. It's regarding the environment. Mm. Um, you know, global warming, climate change, and all of that stuff. Okay. So um, let's get climate change up separate from drones. You have yeah. both in your picture. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. <coughs> Oh, and you weren't there at the beginning. Do you mind just share your first name and my what you're up to? I was going to just some of the just some of the things that I'm going to do. But just, uh, I would just like to start with the university of um, I mean, America. So I, 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 as we always look at uh, Milo, um, uh, Milo, there is not that my personal so mm. Isn't there any other ways to have a military solution? And when it comes to, when it comes to Somalia, America has got a great relationship with Ethiopia, and as we know, um, Barack Obama is going to be in the past of the US. America is a great stakeholder in the decisions that is made in Somalia. Why America is not directly holding Somalia rather than going to Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia mm -hmm. and making a change in how to country? Okay, so building, so let's get both of those really important. <laughs> Um, comments, which I, did you capture it on this page? Okay. Really good one. Okay. Can we, I want to start to dive into some of these together as a group. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then we'll have a chance to add other things to the list. Something this last comment really touched on was you mentioned Libya, also Syria, Somalia, military intervention, picking up on a common theme here. I got to this job almost exactly two years ago, I mean two years ago last week. And the big issue at the time, and you all remember it, you were following it, this was when David Cameron is going to Parliament, he called them back early, and he asked them to consider using military force, British military force, against the Assad regime in Syria for the use of chemical weapons, remember this? Yeah. Okay. So back home in Washington for me, President Obama is having a similar debate with our politicians and with our citizens back home. So it's like day six in my job, and I hear this loud chanting outside my room, I'm outside my office in London. So I, I look out the window, and there's a group of men and women uh, very passionately and very peacefully protesting our embassy. And their signs say, hands off Syria, hands off Syria. They're chanting that. And they're there all day, and I'm there all day, so I'm listening. So they, they say more than that. Here's the argument in a nutshell. You Americans went into Afghanistan 2001. Then you Americans went into Iraq, 2003. I bet the average American couldn't find Syria on a map if you paid him or her. Leave us alone. Okay, hands up. Leave us alone. Very passionate. The exact same time, over on this end of the building, opposite my office, another group of people, equally passionate, roughly 60, 70 people, equally passionate, equally peaceful, Except their signs effectively say, hands on Syria, hands on Syria. And here's their argument. You Americans go into Afghanistan, and then you go into Iraq. You are a very wealthy country with a very powerful military that you've used in these other places. Why not here? Why not now? Assad is gassing children. 
barrel bombing men, women, and children, his own citizens. Now you choose not to use your military might? Shame on you, America. Shame on you, America. Okay, so that is one day in London. And what I wanted to do with you as a group is get, on, get at some of these issues by way of an exercise, thank you, Jody, that we can do together. Okay. So we know what it is to be hands off, as they were arguing that day. Hands on was what the other folks were arguing. And this gentleman here started to talk about all the different ways America can be hands on. An obvious one they were talking about that day was military. Right, the use of military force, whether it be drones, whether it be tanks, whether it be all sorts of different military, or the threat of that. You touched on another way America gets hands on, which is humanitarian aid. Other ones, other ways America gets involved in the world's problems. Yeah. It could be accepting refugees. Yeah, it could be taking refugees, politics. it could be politics. Yeah, so I would do politics, regime, uh, it could be diplomacy. Yeah, yeah, it could be sort of promoting values, democracy, that sort of thing, institution building, helping countries do free and fair elections, or I mean, we could make a long, long list. I think you've hit on some of the key ones. Military aid, now, trade is another one. Issuing debt, forgiving debt is another one. How about when you stop trading with someone? How about not all, yeah, sanctions? I mean, you've read about that. That's a tool we use. So all I'm saying, these are all the different ways that America can be hands-on. Okay, so that's our definition. What I want to ask you to consider is another dimension. We understand hands-on, hands-off. How about this dimension? Did it help? You know, or did it not help? And I want us to quickly, as a group, try to come up. We're going to now look back in history, less at current events right now. We'll get back to those. But in history, let's think of an example from history of an, sort of a textbook example from each of these quadrants. And we'll start with this one. Can you think in history of a place where America gets very hands-on, as we've defined it, and it really helps? Yeah, I mean, that's German. the one I'm looking for. This gentleman shouted out. German in Germany. Yeah, so let's take, if you take World War II as kind of like, most everyone's going to nod their heads to like, we did, we'll talk about when, but we eventually got hands-on. It really helped stop Hitler's armies. Then a related thing, which I sometimes hear, but we'll just do one for now. Marshall Plan, after that war, which ended 70 years ago, you know, last week, we start rebuilding who? Not only our friends in the UK and France, we start rebuilding American taxpayer money, our arch enemies. We rebuild Japan, who we just fought with. Rebuild Germany, right? The place where this aggression had began. So you could add Marshall Plan, but let's for the sake of argument, just say World War II. Now, can you come up with one that's like World War II that most people will nod their heads to? America gets really hands-on and it really doesn't help. Yeah, right. Bosnia. Yeah. Okay, uh, let, me, let me capture these. I want to put a little special list over here for ones to talk about. Somalia. Somalia. I'm trying to get ones that are far enough in the past that we can sort of look back at them with some amount of Somalia. Somalia. So Iraq, yeah, so let's get Iraq up here. We'll talk about it. Libya. Libya, let's get, sorry, I'm going, this is like a little, this is like a little sub one. These are the ones that are going on now. They're off the grid, you know. I need another piece of paper. Somalia? No. I got that one on there. But here's, so I heard it out here. Someone said Vietnam. And I think that's the one that, like here, gets most people, like it's far enough away, right? We've mended our relations with Vietnam. We can look back with some amount of historical perspective and say, we certainly got hands-on, slowly at first, and then more and more and more, and it didn't certainly turn out the way. 
<laughs> yes, ma'am. Ambassador. Uh, Matthew, please. Call me Matthew. Matthew. Um, can, are we going to touch on those criteria like sanction? I mean, it's, it's good to remind ourselves um, sanction in Iraq prior to uh, the fall of Saddam Hussein. If we look how many children did they die because of the result, more than a million, more than a million children of Iraq. So let's talk about it. I think this is as good a time as any to talk about sanctions because this is a tool that the U.S., the United Kingdom, the international community is using more and more, right? You referenced what happened in pre-2003 invasion, sort of Gulf War I, Gulf War II, the sanctions that are in place. And one of the things that was learned from that experience was, wow, you can end up hurting the very people you're claiming to help, okay, by these sanctions if you're not clever about how to do them. So what we're trying to do, now you can argue with whether we've succeeded or not, if you look at the sanctions that the US and the UK are doing with respect to Russia for what they've done in Ukraine, right? they're redrawing the boundaries of Europe at the barrel of a gun. We said, you can't do that. We said, we're not going to start World War III over this thing. We're not doing military right there, even though the Russian separatists, Russian back separatists are doing military stuff. We're coming in trying to help, and we're saying, we're going to be really specific with these sanctions. We don't want to go hurt the Russian people with them, but we want to go make real costs and real consequences to the people doing that. And we're trying to be targeted and really specific with these sanctions, so we don't do it. Cuba, how many people here have followed Cuba? It's probably the most interesting way to reflect on the challenge you raised to us. President Obama changed the policy of the United States. Some people are unhappy, but some people are always unhappy. But what he said, here's what he said. He said, for 50 years, we have had our goal is to help the Cuban people. Now, the way we did it for 50 years, five decades, was we're going to help the Cuban people by isolating the Castro regime. Not letting people, we won't do business with them, we'll discourage other people, from, we'll isolate them, and then we'll get human rights and other things to the Cuban people. What President Obama said, he said, look, we have 50 years of trying, it didn't work. The Cuban people have not been helped by this policy. We're the ones who've been, end up as the United States, a little bit isolated. How we do it? Why don't we try a new tool of engagement to try to go help the people of Cuba since it hasn't worked in 50 years? Let's try something new. So I think, because sanctions aren't a policy, sanctions are a tool that either help or don't help. So if sanctions end up killing children, that's not the right kind of sanctions to use. So how do you do it? And this comes back to drums, which I want to get to in a moment. So let's finish, because we're halfway done. World War II, Vietnam. Now we get to the South. Can you think in history a place where something bad happened, America stays out of it, hands off, no military, no aid, no politics, no diplomacy, just Somebody. bad things happen. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to put up, so let me get, we had some, some of these ones we want to circle to that are going on now, Chechnya. The one I think that rises to the level with sadly enough distance 20 years after to look back is Rwandan genocide. You know this. You know the low estimates, half a million people killed. Higher estimates, well over a million people slaughtered. While the international community, not our problem. I mean, look, that's unfair. Lots of smart people were trying to do their part. But generally, United States government, United Kingdom government, the international community did not. And lots of people have real lessons about if we could do that over again, what would we do differently to prevent that bloodshed? OK, we're almost done. Something bad happens. America stays off out of it. And good things happen. Iran. And, OK, Iran right now? I think the uh, US and Britain, they imported the sanction. They didn't put their hands off Iran. Yeah. But it helps. Well, that's what I would say. I mean, we have not been hands off Iran. Right? We have not. We have imposed sanctions for 30, my entire life. If you go up, I mean, since 1979 and the hostage crisis then, we have, we can't fly there, we don't deal with their diplomats, we have real sanctions, multiple types of sanctions in place. President Obama's worked hard on a deal around their nuclear thing to relieve the nuclear related sanctions. But even after, if that all happens, we're still gonna have a bunch of sanctions in place because of their 
being, as we call it, a state sponsor of terror. Yeah. Uh, my question is, you're talking, uh, thank you very much for sure. having us. And Thanks for my having concern, you. and I'm going back to the constituents, yeah. is that how does it, or how is this relevant mm -hmm. to the Somali community? Mm -hmm. say? Ah. Uh, okay. Because for us, when we go have our tea, we always talk about these issues. However, we try to come back to the reality, which is, well, I can't solve Russia, I can't solve uh, Cuba or any other place in the world. We have real issues to discuss between Somalia, our relationship with your country, sir. Yeah. And if you could focus on that, it will help us quite a lot. Sure. I mean, what, what I want to get at with this discussion is to take it a level beyond what we heard out in front of the embassy that day. Hands on, hands off. And as I travel around the United Kingdom, you can talk to specific groups that care, in this case, a lot about Somalia or a lot about Israel-Palestine as is an issue, a lot about these specific things. Quite often, it can just be sort of a hands-on, hands-off approach, like I saw that day in front of the embassy. And in order for you to help understand our country better, and for me to understand your concerns better, I think it's helpful to say, as we just did, and, and let me finish what I think the lesson from this thing is that can lead to a larger discussion, which is, OK, having done this now 94 times around the UK with groups, you usually get World War II, Vietnam, Rwanda, then you always get a really important list of stuff happening right now, which we'll circle back to. But you suggested Iran. Iran, we weren't hands off. China. We were hands on. China, we've been deeply engaged economically, yeah. hugely. We, re we used to not deal with them. But Nixon went to China back in the early 70s, sent George H.W. Bush there. We started engaging, doing lots of trade. Even though they were communists, that was a big deal during the Cold War for us to do that. So we start getting really hands-on, saying we can't just ignore this huge, proud civilization. We got to engage with it. Some people thought that was crazy, but we thought that was good. So we were hands-on. So if President Obama were here with you today, this is, I think, the argument. This is oversimplified. Life isn't there. A simple grid. But here's, I think, the argument he is trying to make to the United Nations General Assembly, to his fellow world leaders, that good things tend not to happen when America stays out of it. OK? So how do you get America hands-on in a way that's really helpful to some of the issues you guys are passionate about? And how do you get America having, it's not just Vietnam. There are lots of places where we've gotten it either it didn't help or it mostly didn't help or it's sort of halfway. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. How do you learn the lessons? Yeah. Uh, for example, in the Muslim world, America had a very good part. Um, for some Somalia, I mean, America went to 1993. Um, hope of something called mission. But they failed. I mean, 18 soldiers. <coughs> Thousands of Somalians uh, have lost their lives. And after that, I mean, helping Somalians, we have been Somalians for having 19 in 2006. Mm -hmm. We have had military uh, supplies to the Somalia. In this case, the global issue, when mm -hmm. we had a peaceful time in 2006, for the first time, all roads were be flowing, mm -hmm. people were coming around the world to the building of the mission of the part of this development. Absolutely, the George Bush war in terror has helped it with a scenario in the very 60,000 people with the American helicopters and the equipment came with somebody and destroyed all this peace. That's very painful. Mm. So I have never seen again. And this is science again. So we see every day American tanks killing our people. American helicopters, the Kenyans, tens of them, or the Ethiopian tens. And that side is the negative side of America. Well, which is, which is why I asked, right? Because here's, here's the alternative. Here's the alternative. And this is what President Obama tries to say, would say to you today, and what he says to the world community at the United Nations. In, in a few weeks, they'll all be gathered together, if I may. What he says is, he says, look, if it is simple, if the answer is, and for all the complicated, you just touched on the, the um, painful history, 
if the answer is stay out of it, America, okay, what he is saying is like we have a history in our country. We got issues back home. You touched on only a fraction of them. We have racial issues we want to get to in a moment that we're dealing with. We have income inequality and poverty issues we're dealing with back home. We've got lots of problems back home in America that we're wrestling with that we got to go figure out for ourselves. So we're coming off of a decade of two grand wars, right? Iraq, Afghanistan, getting our men and women in uniform back home, trying to do the hard work back home. Those places are far away. People remember Black Hawk Down, right? Mogadish, that's, oh, that's far away. Let those guys deal with it. You guys deal with it. We got stuff to deal with that will be hands off. And that's why I start off with World War II. Now it's comfortably far away, 70 years. You know, you can get nostalgic about it. 75 years ago, this week, yesterday, the aerial bombardment of London began. Incendiary bombs, right? Killing, back to your pictures of air, dropping bombs, killing civilians in London, and soon across the UK. We were good friends with the UK. We didn't join fighting Hitler 75 years ago today. We didn't join fighting Hitler 74 years ago from today. You could say the same about World War I. Europe got into it 1914. We didn't join until 1917. We have a tradition for, I won't get into the reason, and a cultural thing of just staying out of it. But this is the argument President Obama is trying to make. You look at the major issues you're dealing with around the world today. We need to be hands-on. And the argument he's trying to make on is hands-on with all these different tools we have in a smart way, not military first. Sometimes there's a role for military that only military can do, but not always. Let's start with diplomacy. Let's start with these other tools of engagement. Let's do it really trying to help in the broad sense of help, living up to the values we hold true as Americans. And let's do it in partnership with other countries. That tends to be what happens when we get it right. And a big part of getting it right is learning that's why all the places where even for good intentions we've tried it and it hasn't worked the way we want it. And we need to be honest with ourselves about that. That's how we get the best America. And if you get frustrated by down here and you drive this back here, a lot of these big issues around the world, America can't do it alone, but boy, is it a better chance of getting it right if we have America hands-on in the right way. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, um, Somalia faces a lot of problems, and especially the Somali people in general, mm -hmm. um, back in East Africa. We are divided into five different countries now. Before, it used to be maybe one. The British people, uh, the British United Kingdom, divided my people into five different countries, and uh, you know the Europeans. So we've got, you know, I've got family living in Ethiopia as well, who are Somali. I've got my family living in Somaliland, which is mm -hmm. now a self-declared republic since 1991. And then you've got the southern Somalia, which used to be part of us from 1960. 1991. And any time before that, my people used to be one. We were called Somali people. And now we've got into five different borders. So that's not just the only problem. Somalia is poor. The people are very poor. There's a lack of, you know, anything to eat or people to survive on. Our people are nomadic. You know, they live on whatever that, you know, the animals, you know, bring to them. So they have like livestock, and if mm. there's no rainfall or there's not enough um, vegetation or anything for their animals to eat, then our people are in a severe situation where they could all be wiped out. I mean, we're only maybe 10 million or something like that in population. Couldn't the United States help my people by investing into bringing them more? better quality of life and bringing them employment and getting the right people in who care about the actual people. Not but, but you're asking exactly the right questions. I mean, look, I don't have the answers for those very interrelated, complicated things you very articulately laid out, the deep history of it, 
current borders, borders drawn a long time ago, the current needs. And this is where I think we need to be honest with each other. It's like, okay, so you're asking for more American involvement, right? Can't no. America do more? Yeah? No, actually, um, I personally think it's up to us as a nation to decide that we can help each other. That's why. I mean, it's nice that we have been systems for this um, legal aid and everything like that. But um, it's up to us really as a nation and as a government. But I'm what do I want to? I just want to collect some other opinions. I'm talking about the investment. It's not about. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I hear you. I hear you want more of a certain type of this hands-on, and you're well, saying thank you for the, the, what you've done so far. But hey, the next bit has to be. Don't worry. Um, how about the safety of someone in the U.S. Away? Okay, let's get to that. I want to save that for the sort of what's happening back home, domestically. Um, uh, just let me, let me get to some folks who haven't spoken yet. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my issue here again, I'm sorry I will always interfere a few uh, here and there, but when you say help, that automatically we are not talking on, on equal terms. So you will be asking uh, America to help? That is a no-no. For us, we only ask God for help. All we can say is, can we work in a good relationship, in partnership, rather than asking for help? Oh, sorry. Well, what, what I defined, when I used help, it was in a different context. Th this dimension is getting hands-on. So the kind of help you're talking about is aid, debt relief, you know, all the different ways we can help try to address some of the issues you talked about. Now, you may say, we don't need it. We're on our own. We'll look to other powers, other places for that. No. This definition of help, I meant something very different. Did it work or didn't it work? Right? Did it work? Did it help to make the world more peaceful, more prosperous, more just, if you had to define help a little more? Yes, ma'am. I think America as a nation is a great country, and I think we can work, we are the Somali. Somali, I think they are very, Somalia as a country is a very rich country. Uh, Somali people are very proud, are very innovative, and are very clever. But we have to be honest here and talk about, we can talk about Afghanistan and everywhere, but we are Somali, we have to focus on Somalia. Somalia is a great country, but at the same time, at this moment, we have got so many countries around neighbors who are getting involved. And whether they are healthy, I don't think they are healthy. They are creating a lot of stability. One of the countries is Ethiopia. Ethiopia has got the majority of Muslim people, but nobody knows. And we are the Somali. We see Ethiopia as a government, a country, a country, as a Christian army who came to our country and did a lot. They killed a lot of people. They did a lot of horrible to women. They bought, I know friends who were, their family were bought in the, in the um, boiling, um, but at this stage, we have to say these three countries, whether it's Uganda, Kenya, and Ethiopia, they have got financial incentives from the United States of America to get involved in our country. And that, Matthew, has to stop because they are creating. So, on that, on that issue, you want less hands on with its neighbors. That's what they, you're they saying. Are, because they of the. Are, they are doing okay. it because they want yes, the financial, so financial I hear income. Yeah. And I personally believe if America kept their hands in the situation back, if we actually let them work with us, somebody would have been in a much better position than they are today. Just going back to that talk, um, uh, right now, for the past two decades, America has been supporting our neighbors, such as Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda, to make to make a change um, um, to make a change and some sort of reform of government for um, uh, for Somalia, but that hasn't worked. So what I think could work is working with Somalia, although I don't have the faith in that system government right now. 
I mean, it's, it's one of the issues you talked about culture. It's one of the things when you start down this journey and you look about where where we've gotten it wrong in the recent past, and is when we think things can be easy and change can happen really quickly. You get expectations high, and then you get frustrated. People give up. Or the other thing, you think this is hopeless. And I think certainly what President Obama thinks is that things aren't hopeless. We have to try. We have to try, and if we've tried and haven't gotten it right, we've got to learn from that and try something different. We have to keep moving forward and keep on trying. I want to make sure we capture other ideas before getting back to your question around media. Yeah. Uh, I think I've got a different view from a friend of um, Somalis. I think we need America to be a club in Somalia, to be honest with you. But quite honestly, and a good way. I think it's America to scrub out the world of the country in that we situation, everything. We need to learn from them, we need their help, but not just for their interests, but also for the interests of the Somalis. Mm. I agree that. And create a sort of you know, good relationship. I mean, Americans always put on the coalition. Americans are working through everywhere. Mm. And, uh, they have no relationship. Even they were having you know, the sort of dresses. But today, the relationship is really tough in tough sense. Because our neighbors are, not, are trying to destroy every attempt they're trying so much to go there for the government. And that is a problem. That's why we're frustrated, and, and that's what we talk. So, what, 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 so one argument, here, just to, to summarize it here, is okay. <coughs> your take, your opinion, not mine. America has been hands-on in dealing with Somali's neighbors in a way that you think is not helpful. Absolutely. Yes. And so, okay, what can you go change so that America? How do you get it higher up here? Absolutely. Um, not saying just get out of it. No. Or you might say instead of you know maybe. Yeah. Okay. I want, to, I want to get to this question about media and about our country and about Somalis in America because I think it's important and part of the things is, part of my job is to try to make, um, help you understand us a little bit more just as I'm learning more about you and what makes us tick. And, and again, and I touched on a little bit of it, which is we've got issues back home. Yes, sir. I think, again, there's a gentleman here who said investment and I think we will welcome investment. The things we welcome and the things we don't welcome. We don't welcome interference, but we welcome investment like any other nation. We welcome respect, but we don't welcome uh, uh, interference again through either neighbors or through other proxies. We do not uh, welcome that. We welcome uh, transfer of technology and education. We welcome that, but we do not welcome uh, the brain drain that's going on, making people refugees, making people, uh, creating an environment in Somalia where people cannot live anymore by putting one against each other and having all the people who are educated, who can live, who are fit to live, to leave the country, and therefore to create an environment where the place becomes ungovernable, that we cannot welcome. And that is what has ha been happening for a very long time, for the last, uh, some people are here, what, just born yesterday, mm. probably, but it has been happening probably s since you were born. That has been the American policy in Somalia. It has been a negative policy. What we want, and all the young people, they're here because their country is not safe for them to live. So what we are asking, if you could present to your country that A, we want, we will welcome investment on equal terms. But we, of course, we have to be investment ready because we've been drained. You can, you have to understand. We have to be able to negotiate on, on a contract on a fair basis. But we cannot have a situation whereby uh, American uh, firms with the very uh, dominating, uh, for example, uh, tactics to come and negotiate with someone who cannot read and write mm -hmm. and expect that to, for us to, to accept that. So we will welcome investment, but at the right time. So first we have to be investment ready. That uh, hands-on we will welcome. We'll welcome uh, uh, 
uh, transfer of technology, transfer of education. Of course, you're gifted, you have that. We will accept that. But that if you can work on Yeah, I just think, I think history teaches us it is easy and it's so tempting to nod as you made that last point. Transfer of education. Sounds easy. I could write it down. Mm. Hard. Deeply hard. It, you can't, I mean, think about how hard it is in our own country to do it. This is the part I just want to shift to the United States and understand what we're dealing with in the United States because if you know what we're up to, what we're trying to achieve, how we're trying to engage with the world, it can make these partnerships between countries yeah. work better. And if one has an idea that this is some magic thing you grab off a shelf and put in, like yeah, it doesn't that, work that way. Maybe we wish it did, but it doesn't. We, we well, I can't be, think of anyone where it works. We, we would be happy to uh, have some of the young people to work with you probably, or one of your teammates, to figure out how to go about it and how can that transfer of education and uh, technology happen. They're very bright young people here who you could work with. You could create a, a steering committee, work with your government through your other embassies as well, and coordinate that. Uh, lastly, we would welcome you to support the unity of Somalia as one United Nation, rather than as a disunited country. That's something we would welcome as well. I hear you, and we can follow up with this group after about you know, what our efforts are as the government. I mean, my job is here for the United Kingdom, so that's what I do, and not, uh, not there. But we have lots of things going on because the president and our administration and cares a lot about that neighborhood. Let me, let me just take you, because you asked about media. I'm not a good artist, so this is my bad version of the United States. That's Florida, Texas, California. <coughs> Okay, there are 300, there's more than that, but 300 million Americans. Yeah, I just find that, to keep the math simple for the exercise we're about to do. So someone asked about media, and I was curious if there was any particular, because I get this question a lot as I travel around the UK. And yeah. Okay. Um, do you agree that the United States of America created the law during 1968 with the Civil Rights Act of 1968, Title 18 of the United States Code, which is USC, and um, it quotes, and I say, um, requirements of the United States, United States Sentencing Commission to increase the penalties for hate crimes committed on basis of actual race or perceived color, religion, national origin, gender, um, ethnicity, and everything called the person you think you're aware of that Yeah, I think it was 1965. Yeah. But guess what? Yeah. This law was updated by Barack Obama in um, October um, 20, the 28th, 2009. And he actually signed um, a Matthew Shepherds and Jane Byrith um, Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act, which is attached to the national um, National Defense Authorization Act of fiscal year 2010. So he updated that law and he actually extended it. Now here's my question for you. How are you having shows like Family Guy insulting Jews, South Park insulted, insulting Somalis and every other culture, and most famously the Fox News, who depicts a biased, um, <coughs> all sorts of prejudiced acts, and it's all of these shows are clearly expressive. So, so let me get so, 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 so let me get at, uh, at, at both sides of your question. Mm -hmm. So how many, so 300 million people in America? Yeah. How many people watch Fox News? Just guess. Yeah, 10. 10 percent. Okay, so 10 percent would be 30 million. <coughs> I heard 20 million. I heard 10 million. So, do you want to know the real number? Yes. Three million. So one percent. Ish. Now these are. And I'm not picking on that. Happens. That's the highest rated of that type of show, right? 
and MSNBC, which is sort of the left-wingy sort of equivalent, has about, I think, half that. The middle one, CNN, is sort of two point something. So I think it's really important to remember yeah. in the United States that, think about the United States like this. You know, we have just like, we have very left views, very right views, if you want to think about that, that aren't very, not many people, but they're loud and really passionate. Okay, and I'll get to that. Most people in America, right in the middle, right? So that's an important thing. And then I want to get to your point around Voting Rights Act, hate crimes, et cetera, and freedom of speech. So we try it the next American you meet. Just say the phrase, we the people, and Americans sort of sit up straight and we smile. And we do that because it's the first three words of our Constitution. And most of us probably don't know a lot of all the actual words in it, but we know some really important things that are enshrined in it. Freedom of speech, one second. Freedom of speech, freedom to peacefully assemble, like those people did here yes. in London. That's all the First Amendment in our Bill of Rights. Freedom of what else? Freedom Religion. Yeah. Yeah. Freedom of assembly, freedom of association, all those things freedom are in our first freedom. article. Then we get on to our second item in our Bill of Rights. Do you know what that is? Um, everyone will have rights to keep and bear arms, if I'm correct. That's good. We, and it's a little worded slightly different. You're basically absolutely right. It's worded in such a way that Congress will not make allow denying people the right to bear arms. And the whole thing is about forming a militia, which back then in 17, this is 1780s when we wrote this down. So we're proud of those freedoms that are in there. Do you know what else is in there? back in our Constitution when we wrote it down in 1780? Slavery. 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 So let's just be, so we say we the people, let's just, let's do a little quick history tour. What we meant in 1780 was we the white male Protestant landowning people, okay? If you were Catholic back then, couldn't vote. Didn't own land, couldn't vote. So in the decades after the 1780s, we change it. So we get rid of the religious requirement. So now you don't have to be Protestant. Then we get rid of the landowning requirement. Okay, now we're up to the 1860s. Something big happens in America in the 1860s. Civil War. Civil War. Abraham Lincoln, we abolish slavery. Okay? Then, it takes us 50 years after our Civil War. So now, at this point, after the Civil War, it's we the male people. 50 years after the Civil War, we give 50% of our population the right to vote. Yeah. Okay, so now men and women can vote, and you don't have to be Protestant, you don't have to own land, you can be any color. So do you think we're all done? you think the struggle stops? Yeah. No? No, it doesn't stop. Why? And you mentioned it, sir. 1960s. We have our civil rights movement. Why? Because, yeah, slavery was abolished, segregation was alive and well. Parts of our American South, the virtual apartheid. So you may have had the legal right to vote, but as a practical matter, you couldn't actually vote if you were African American. So we had lots of people you've heard of, like Dr. King, lots of people you've never heard of. Brave men and women, activists, showing up, protesting. It was a fight. So do you think it's all over after the 1960s? No. So a lot of the issues you touched on today are the ones we are grappling with right now. Issues of police brutality, I think, connect all the way back up to that history. We've made great progress. <coughs> we elected our first African-American president. That's a big deal. And you know what? One of the first things he said after he got elected was, it is a big deal. And he only was able to do that because of the fights of the civil rights movement. But and he always said this publicly and privately. He said, please don't think because you've elected a black president that we're living in some post-racial bliss with everyone getting along and all the problems going away. They haven't gone away. We have hard work to do. Immigration. You've seen the debate here in this country. We have a different flavor of the debate back home. But that's a big thing we're debating. Uh, immigration, police brutality, LGBT rights. You talk about Matthew Shepard, hate crime law. 
What else? What else are we struggling with? Poverty. Inequality. Inequality of money. Yeah. Right, so these are, we got lots of issues we are grappling with. And I think our country at our best is, by the way, I should finish what they said. So it says, we the people, do you know what comes next after that phrase? We have a constitution expert here. This is a real joy. It says, to form a more perfect union. What I love about that phrase is the subset of it that says more perfect. So the people who wrote it down in 1780 knew that it wasn't perfect, and they have the wisdom to know it never would be perfect, and it won't. But look at the journey we've been on as a country, and it hasn't been easy. This makes it look easy and simple. It's hard. But we keep expanding the circle of who's included. You talk to brothers and sisters living in Minnesota, part of just one example of a vibrant Somali community in the United States. Right? Some are thriving, some have struggled. They're dealing with Islamophobia as is something that America wrestles with. But you know what? Has anyone ever been to Boston, Massachusetts? Probably not. That's where I grew up. If you went to Boston, Massachusetts today, you would think Irish, I mean, Irish Americans, John Kennedy, our president, JFK, was from there. I mean, it is a proudly very sort of Irish American kind of city. A mm. hundred years ago, when my grandparents were around, there would be signs in the windows. Like as you walk down the high street, Irish need not apply. Terrible racism, prejudice against Irish people. In New York, against Italians. Right? So our journey is, when you came into this system, it was tough. But eventually, we get it right, and we assimilate that people can plug into the American dream, as we call it. We have to keep on renewing that dream. We've got to keep on challenging ourselves. And a big way we get better and we keep expanding that circle is because we are humble enough at our best to be self-critical. And we're confident enough to be self-corrective. And that's where you all come in, because you've been very honest with me today, sharing frustration, sharing concerns. That's how we get better. We get better on foreign policy, on how to be more helpful. We get better about what we're like as a country, because as a gentleman pointed out here at the beginning, what happens back home reflects around the world. So we think of guns as just a domestic issue back home. It's not, because at every single place I've been to around the UK, it's the number one. You know, Most people raise their cards. When we collect these cards at the end, I'll have more pictures of guns than I will of any other of these other important issues we've talked about. But how do we talk about that? How do we think about that? Yeah. Uh, uh, Protect the right to keep and bear arms, if I'm correct. Um, is it true? That's half of it. That's, it? Yeah, that's half. Yeah. I know there's more to No, it. the first half's really interesting. No one ever quotes the first half. And I won't get it right. You may have it down there. Yeah. The first half is a free, something like a state militia being necessary to a free state, comma. No law shall be made infringing the right of people to bear arms. So our debate during this time in our country has been, is that right an individual right to have a gun, or is that right a collective right to be able to form a militia? This was written after we beat the British Army. The only way we beat the British Army was a bunch of ragtag farmers had guns that weren't registered with the British authorities so they could fight back. Now, that's an oversimplified version of history, but it is true. And so we brought that when we wrote this down. So this is a big debate back home. We, it's constitutional, it's cultural. Right? Our whole country was founded with guns. So those pilgrims way before our revolution came over with guns. They formed a big part of our revolution, getting independence from the United Kingdom, from England. They formed a big part of how we settled the United States. And so it's deeply cultural. And then finally, it's controversial. We're having big debates back home in our democracy about President Obama's trying to change some things about how our gun laws work. Other people are really against it. We're fighting about it. And that's how our system works. We have these democratic fights, and we change. Yeah. So what's your plan now? I mean, you haven't you know, discussed or told us anything about the future plans on Somalia, Somaliland. Yeah, look, my job is not. U.S. Ambassador to Somalia, right? That's not my job. 
My job is to engage with British citizens and to talk to smart future and current leaders of the UK, that's you guys, and to hear what's on your mind. So we heard a lot about Somalia today. We heard about other things that aren't specific to Somalia. And to hear those concerns, to share a little bit about how my country looks at the world, thinks about things, how we're struggling, so that we can increase understanding. But I'm not here to give specific, you know, that's not what I do here. And we can also, after this session, connect you with the things the U.S. government is doing, what USAID is doing, what we're doing with diplomatic, what we're doing with all the different tools we have. Yes, sir. Um, one thing that frustrates me is um, one of the famous athletes, Mofara, when he was traveling to the USA and America, he got stopped and, you know, searched and humiliated because of his name was Mohammed. So, you know, he's got stopped and, you know, the way they actually asked him questions about that, you know, it's just, you know, it's a big insult for us as Somali, uh, Somali people traveling to, you know, America, especially if your name is Mohammed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it touches on the issue of tolerance in the United States. And again, I focused on, hey, look how far we've come. Look how far we still have to go. Yeah, so we can look back 100 years at how the Irish are treated. Now it's okay. The Italian-Americans, how they were treated. You know, and what, what Bo Farah had to deal with, which no one should have to deal with. I mean, that is not what we are, and we are as a country at our best, ashamed when things like that happen. Because you know what? Everyone in America had a parent who was an immigrant at some point, you know? And so that's not who we are at our best. It happens, and we need to see it. That's why the President Obama updated those laws. Um, and that was to deal with really awful, blatant, violent things. There are a lot of subtle things that you point out that don't rise to the level of crimes. But you know what? They're small insults. They're small put-downs that are really bad because if those are amplified time and time again, that is just corrosive to who we are as a country. Those are little minuses, minuses against you know, puncturing that expansion. So we've got to fight back against that, push back against that. We can do together now. There's one job between you and us, as a British citizens and some other citizens, is about um, collective responsibilities from both sides, from the United States and from Somalia, because um, we need to build the, 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 the gap between the two countries. I mean, our, re our relations has been deteriorated for the last eight, mm -hmm. 20 years. So what we do now and me is we engage with the Somalis, and that, and that is the first step. Um, I'm respecting that, and thank you for that. Um, I mean, we see nowadays Americans and maybe more uh, the Somalis and other Europeans or Western uh, uh, countries. And uh, now what we're doing is from Somalis and ourselves is to engage with the Americans and you know, the two nations to communicate this side by side. Um, we can have diplomats, you know, good relationships. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're the relationships we happen with my bad geography here. So here's Washington, D.C., you know, roughly, our nation's capital. Lots of good things happen. You know, some tiny fraction of our 300 million people live there. What's amazing, there's a wonderful map I wish I had. You can Google it, which is the map of the United States, um, and it shows worldwide remittances. You know, and it's really cool. So you look from, you know, all the money leaving the United States, going down to South America, going to East Asia, going to Africa, going to, and it's amazing. And I think it's a wonderful, different way of looking at the United States and getting a window into that 300 million. That's just a number. The diversity and complexity of who comprises our country, where they came from really recently or far back. And that's just tracing where they send their money. But you can learn a lot about where people send their money because they work hard for it and look at how generous they're being back to where they came from. And you look at that picture and you think, wow, what strength there is from all of that. And to choose to look at it as a strength, I think, is the key. Yes, sir. Were you raising your hand? No. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, in the back. Yeah. Uh, thank you again. Um, bringing closer to you, Kay, now. Uh, we've been trying to push you to Somalia. I know it's not your portfolio, but we hope you get the message and pass the message. 
However, coming back to the UK now, uh, as we are all aware, the uh, US has got a lot of investment in the UK, especially big companies, Microsoft and so forth. You name them. You have contacts with them, you always have dinner with them. We have a lot of unemployed. Uh, you do not always have dinner with them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've checked your Twitter. <laughs> so I've done a little bit of background research. Uh, my suggestion or my proposal is since we have a lot of uh, young, intelligent people who are looking for work, how about if you could link them up with three offices? with these American companies because it's very frustrating for young people here to get jobs. And of course every country has the similar problems and I appreciate maybe in your country as well. Yeah, but so I, have a, I guess a two-part answer. Um, it's never a satisfying answer if you're in a position like mine or any of ours to say what I'm about to say. It's a little bit like in America, if you go to get your driver's license, it's usually not a very happy experience. You, know, you wait a long time, you get there, and you've forgotten one piece of paper, and you have to go back. It's frustrating. There's an element of that, which is, hey, look, our job here, you know, to gauge with the bread. So I, I do have something that I want young members of this community and all the people you know to sign up with and join that we are doing. Um, getting people who live in UK jobs in the UK isn't one of them. I'm aware. Right, and important, and so I've got important boundaries to what I can do and supposed to do, so I don't want to overpromise and not deliver there. What we are doing, and a big part of our job, is the future. We talk a lot about the past, about US, UK, winning World War II, blah, blah, blah. What are the next 70 years look like? What, are we still going to be really good friends as a country? Are we still going to do things like fighting Ebola together in West Africa? Remember a year ago, the panic, a million people might die. Now look, it's not over in West Africa. I know we've been talking about other parts of Africa. It's not over, but the US and the UK stood up big time, far away from both of our shores, stood up and did it together. That's not by accident. It's because there's mutual trust, values that say we should care about things beyond just right in front of our borders. So we're starting a program called Young Leaders UK, trying to get in touch and to know young leaders in the UK maybe in activism or business or culture or diplomacy or education, all of finance, anything. Get to know them. Uh, get together in person, which is how tonight, I mean, today's session happened through one of these engagements. Um, so I said, sure, I'll come. Um, get together face-to-face. -to -face. Get together once a month on the phone or online, a Google Hangout, talk. I'll bring in speakers from the US and elsewhere to talk about leadership and share and try to make each other smarter. And then when we find out about cool exchange opportunities to go to the United States, to let folks know how they are, where they are, and how they can raise their hand to try to be part of that. We appreciate yes, that very much. So it's a great question. I don't know if everyone heard it. How can you reach out to young people back in the United States, here in the United Kingdom? And part of your question was so that young, clever people with lots of future in front of them don't go to ISIS, to ISIL, to go kill others and themselves. Yeah, I mean, that's a big, big question. Our small thing we're trying to do is that Young Leaders UK program I just told you about. Joining, and I, I had the privilege of working on President Obama's political campaign twice, back when no one thought he could ever win. And it's really powerful to go out there and ask people to join things. And I think it certainly is part of the American culture I'm really proud of. People, it's a nation of joiners. You go to any city, I live right in the middle of America, people are always asking you, please join this, join that, join, join, join. Help. So we got a lot of issues and we need a lot of help. So we're always asking people for help. And I think that's really important because it's also important 
But if all we're doing is saying, don't join, don't, 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 and we're doing a lot of finger pointing and a lot of saying, don't join, and we mean it when we say, please don't join that awful organization, I think we have an obligation, all of us, to say, please do join like what you guys are doing together, what other groups in this building are doing. Community organizing, that's what President Obama did before he ever became an elected official. He's a community organizer. That's, and he's really proud of that, and that's how he's approached his job as president, actually, to try to organize communities to get stuff done together. Which brings it back to the point you were making earlier in this session. Of like, look, there's a bunch of governments can do, and we should do it, and we are doing it. But communities pulling together for themselves, nothing replaces that. You can temporarily fix it for a while, but if communities don't do it, take care of it on their own, it's not going to happen. It's probably a good way to wrap up, but I was hoping for 30 seconds, this is the fun bit, can you flip over the card, please, and just write the first word that pops into your mind if I ask you, no pictures this time, we don't have time, one word about something that either you like or gives you hope or inspires you about the United States. Please. Yeah, just quickly write it down, if you could. Jody, could I ask you to come and quickly? All right, we'll go really quickly here, but this is the fun part. I mean, it's all really enjoyable, but yes. Working together. Working together all. Democracy. Same thing. Open-minded. Open-minded. Um, future environment. Ah, yeah, we did talk about climate. Peace. Anything? Open-minded. Open-minded. Open Teamwork. Peace. Peace. Teamwork. Teamwork. Oh, helping each other. Sir? Hands off. Hands off. Okay. <laughs> Freedom. Peace and respect. Peace and respect. Democracy. Freedom of worship. Freedom of worship. Yeah. Peace. Okay. Other ones, I won't force everyone to go do it. Any from the back there? Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. Yeah, I mean, you talked about, and it's worth, you know, uh, where did he go? The wonderful gentleman, he left. But anyway, he was, he was talking about frustrations like these TV shows that say things that insult you. Fundamentally, we have signed up, sir, just answering your question. We have signed up in our system. We take this freedom of speech thing really seriously. If you take freedom of speech really seriously, it means people have the freedom to offend people. And they do it 24 hours a day in every part of that bad American map I did. But they do it every day. And what it puts on all of us is to speak up against it. So if we're offended by it, we can't shut it down, I mean, with a few exceptions. We've just signed up for freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and that means people will be offended, and we got to rise to defend our brothers and sisters when mean, awful, insulting things are said about them, and stick up for them, and exercise our own free speech. That's how we do it in our system. And you all have been incredibly open, honest, and free with your frustrations, which I always like to spend more time with, but also with your hopes and what you like. And so I am really, really grateful for all your time, and I'll have folks on my team follow up with this group, I'll be through you, and just um, about some of the more tactical and tangible things that the U.S. government's doing, um, not only in Somalia, but in the region. Yeah? I want to say this, I know that it's such a you know, and back from Somalia, you know, and they I believe all of the uncovered they don't bring up this whole, you know, trophies. But everywhere you go to, you go to flags. The second one is going to be in the UK, because you have flags. But in America, when you see, you only see this in the UK, they compare it to a car or a tank or whatever. That's what the other people saw in the field. We always create a problem or something. That's what they do. They don't do any education to bring it from the country to do a little one step. The first two are definitely brought that you can see in Turkish. The second one is going to be here. What do you just come to? I know you're in here. It's not just that one. We need something a little bit okay. Do I hear you. you. Know, just take out some money and say, oh, please, I'm going to do this or that. Yeah. I'm not going to be here. 
I hear you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you all so much for being uh, so open and so honest. I learned a lot. Thank you. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. I would like to call someone to more organized all this. We couldn't do without them. Come here. Nice to meet you, Matt. He's a real man. This is a man oh. behind all this. Community. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for your leadership. We, we are delighted to have you, and we hope to see you more and more. Absolutely, and please. The United Kingdom. So here it is. Here yeah. is. This is how to sign up for Young Leaders UK. We call it Why Luck, Young Leaders UK. So if you go there, you can find out how to apply, and we'd love to have uh, you all join it. And if you know people you think would be interested who aren't in the room today, please pass on that link to them. That's how we'll keep growing. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muhammad Omar. I'm 18 years of age. Uh, today we had a very informative discussion with the ambassador of the United States of America to the UK, His Excellency, Mr. Matthews. And through this informative discussion, we, we, we as Somali community realize how we can be involved in diplomatic relations here in the community in London itself and broad of the UK. And we found it very informative and we look forward to many more events such as this in the future. Thank you. Hello, my name is Akhtarim Abdul Elmi. Um, I'm 17 years old and it was a lovely experience for me to have for the uh, UK ambassador and the American ambassador to come. And I have very, my experiences, uh, I've never had experience that, I've never had experience with that, that I'm with uh, uh, someone so high up in the government. And I'm very happy and pleased to see to see um, the UK ambassador and American ambassador. Thank you very much. Time. So, dear Mr. Matthew, next time if you would like to give me more time to actually speak um, and maybe a one-to-one -one conference related to the uh, civilization of Somalia, the economy of Somalia, and even the reputation of Somalia itself, um, then yes, it would be very much likely for us to have a very good political religious debate thank you very much i hope to see you soon um, right. my name is Mohammed adan a young ambassador for princess trust charity and a member of somali a of somali community uh i would like to thank uh, the ambassador matthew the u.s ambassador to uk who better visit today to us to just see and discuss with us what we see and how we believe the foreign policy and what the united states stands for which was really uh, very vital and important to have such a, a, a pleasure with the U.S. ambassador. I would like to thank him for coming to us and listening to us, which is really something that we have never seen before. Uh, therefore, I would like to thank also Universal TV, who organized this uh, meeting. Um, what we have discussed it was not only about Somali issues, it was the U.S. policy towards Middle East, towards the world, what U.S. does and what they did in the beginning, like what they did in the World War, how they helped it to promote the peace into the world. I think it was very, very uh, important, uh, but I think the ambassador, the ambassador, he did not want it to listen, he did not want it to answer all about the question is directly he was I think from a point of from a point of view he was skipping from some of the questions that we ask him directly I don't know whether that's a diplomacy way or not but we are grateful to have him today here so I think we have learned a lot from him thank you very much Mr. Ambassador my name is my name is Kaltfun and I would like to say thank you Ambassador Matthew who has been here today the meeting was fantastic, we like it, all of us will enjoy it, and we would like to say come back again, uh, we will wait you, and we will say thank you very much, everybody will say thank you very much. Oh, hi, good afternoon, it's been a pleasure to take part in our meeting with uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Matthew, we would like to thank you, me and Kaltoon, my name is Ahmed, and uh, the meeting was very useful, we enjoyed it all the Somaliland and Somali community in Hanislau. Thank you very much.
Uh, my name is Faduma. I'm a journalist, uh, Somali National TV, based in UK. I really enjoyed the meeting, and I'm appreciate everything they done it for it, for Somali community, and especially this community particular. I'm telling them thank you so much for inviting us and then letting me know what's going on around and uh, inviting for the ambassador. Thank you very much. Hello, Matthew. I would like to thank you for your videos. Okay. Hello, Matthews. I would like to thank you for your information, sharing out your ideas and with your history about the America. And, you know, we would like to thank you about your, you know, thoughts and, you know, listen to us, what we have to say about the Americas. And I would like to <coughs> thank you for your, you know, sharing your ideas with us. And we hope to see you again. Thank you, um, and American Ambassador Matthew, for sharing your knowledge with us. And hopefully we'll see you again. And thank you for what you taught us. My name is Safnan. I would like to thank the American ambassador and would like to have you more times.